Hi guys, welcome to Let's Talk Business. We put new videos up here every week, so don't forget to subscribe. Welcome to Let's Talk Business. Now we've come outside, which makes a real big difference, and there's a very good reason that we have come outside. Uh, I'm joined by Max Dickmet, and Max, it's great to have you. Now, not many people will know about you, um, but I would say that of the people I've met, you are possibly one of the more successful. And uh, it's a journey I want to have a little chat through with you, if I can. You started investing in property, what, at 16, 17 years old? Yeah, but, well, 16 and a half, 17. When I left school, all I was good at at school was sport. Um, but unfortunately, rugby union was still amateur then. And just by chance, I met a lady in the Hacienda nightclub in Manchester who was an estate agent in London. And um, we kept in touch and the rugby wasn't going great so I uh, popped down to London to see her. In fact we were supposed to be going on holiday and um, I arrived and she said I can't go. And I thought well why, on earth, why didn't you tell me before I set off and what had happened was is she was the manageress of the estate agents and she wasn't very nice to her staff so they all decided to resign the day she was going on holiday. So she couldn't go on holiday because she had no staff. So instead of two weeks in Barbados, I had two weeks working in an estate agent. Um, now, most people would think, oh, estate agency, two weeks doing that. Uh, you actually made the most of it, though, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just sat in the shop and um, no computers in those days and took people's details. And actually, I, I loved it. It was um, just by sheer luck I fell into a estate agency. And I never knew I had a passion for it. Well, most people could actually treat that as a job. And that's not one thing that you, you've done at all. So you started obviously investing in your own property. Well, um, I mean, this lady now, unfortunately, she's um, no longer with us. But um, Diana was a real entrepreneur, and uh, she very quickly taught me that uh, I should have property because, however small it is, it goes up in value the whole time, and it buys you financial security. So my very first uh, 18th birthday, um, I exchanged contracts on my first flat because you're not allowed to get a mortgage until you're 18, um, which is a little flat in Surbiton, which is um, South London, South West London. And it was a studio flat that was very large, so all I had to do was put a wall in and make it into a small one bedroom flat. Buying it for 19,000, I spent two or three thousand doing the work and sold it for 29. So I think I made 7,000 pounds on my first property venture. But my salary then was 3,000 a year. So I was very excited. 7,000 was more than I earned in an entire year in my day job. I imagine you didn't spend the profits on a trip to Ibiza. Did you reinvest? Absolutely. Um, I used that money actually as two deposits uh, for two little houses in Kingston upon Thames um, by the university. Um, I renovated those and sold them. I remember buying one for 30 and the other one for 36,000 and sold them for nearly 70. Um, so they were much better. I made roughly 25,000 profit on each. And once that had happened, I then used that money to set up my first estate agency. And I set up on my own in um, Richmond upon Thames um, by the time I was 20, 21 years old. The picture you're painting though is that you have a little bit of money, you invest it and you take a profit and then you reinvest that profit. If it were that simple, Max, everyone will be doing it. Well, the hardest bit is getting the initial deposit. Um, so I just got myself four jobs. I was a waiter in the Richmond Hill Hotel on a Monday night. I was a waiter in a restaurant called Bastian's that was in Hampton Court on a Friday and a Saturday. And next door was a nightclub and I used to work, I used to finish my waiter's job and then go straight into the nightclub and work behind the bar from 11 till two in the morning. And that was great because I was being fed I had food, I had drink, um, very little overheads, uh, so I was able to save money very quickly. So what aspects of a property do you look for before you invest in it? Every single property I have bought has had a planning angle of some sort. So if I did buy a flat, which isn't my preference, I prefer freehold property, but if it was a flat, I'd buy one that had a large roof space that maybe I could go into and make it larger, or that had a large garden. Um, where I could develop and build something at the bottom. At the bottom, um, But everything had a planning angle. So not only would I get rent in, but my big payday would be when I got planning permission and then I'd build the project out. Is it about accumulating the properties or is it about selling them? I don't believe in selling properties. Every property that I've developed, I still own. Um, I develop it and then get a bigger mortgage to get my money back out. Um, because 
property just keeps on going up and up and up. One of the first houses I bought I've still got today and that's in Kingston upon Thames. Little two up, two down. I bought it for £30,000 and it's now worth about £600,000, 640000 and I've had it continually let for the last 30 years and I've actually worked out that I've made 197,000 profit on the rent as well. So looking around here we've obviously got a lot of properties that are buy to let and I would say very few owner occupiers and it's a very nice part of the world overlooking the channel as we are. Are there other parts of the country that are worth investing in? The Bournemouth Boscombe area absolutely is waiting to explode and um, the property prices in this area are the same now as they were in 2007 now that's a long time that's eight years if you have a look at london since 2007 property prices there have doubled if not tripled so it's only a matter of time before that filters south so should max people be looking at maybe hs2 and looking at the hubs that that's going to be creating up and down the backbone of the country Infrastructure is what changes property prices. I'll give you a, an example. When we got given the Olympics, I rushed up to Hackney and thought, right, I'm going to buy as much property as I can because I heard they were putting in a new tube station. I heard they were changing all the roads because the traffic congestion around Hackney was diabolical. And there was an area next to Hackney called Homerton, which is E5, which was incredibly cheap. Hackney was too expensive and it was the property stock was in such poor condition that the government had made it stamp duty free if you bought under 150,000. Now a nice two bedroom flat there at the time was about 170. Um, so I bought as many two bedroom flats as I could at 150 and under, so there was no stamp duty. I managed to buy 19 of them. I've still got them to this day. Um, they're all worth 340, 370, 380. Um, and I let them all to Hackney Council who have very little housing stock and they pay £1,100 a month uh, for a two bedroom flat on a three and five year lease. So you don't even have to deal with estate agents, you just let it direct to the council and they put their own people in. Now what's happened there will happen anywhere else in the country where there's infrastructure changes. Now clearly you've been very successful building up a large property portfolio but you're not stopping there. Tell me a little bit about your new business. Um, we started a business um, 11 months ago called Saxe Coburg. It, uh, it was a challenge. I already have a chain called Love It, uh, Love It International, who are around Bournemouth and Christchurch, which really hits the mid market. But Camford Cliffs, they're all very expensive houses, and typically all the customers went to Savills, Knight Frank, all the prestigious upmarket London agencies. And Love It was struggling. All it was ever getting instructions it was one and two bedroom flats we just never got any of the big houses so I thought oh I'm not gonna there's no point selling meat if no one's buying meat um, I had to change it it was the same shop same staff but we changed the branding from blue and yellow to black and gold new name as soon as off the sale boards went off the phones rang off the hook um, it's been incredible uh, we've currently got over 20 houses on our books over two million pounds in fact we've got one property on our books at 55 million we would have never had those on our stock if, uh, if we hadn't have rebranded and uh, there's no other change substantial change other than the rebranding no not whatsoever same phone number same premises it's just all marketing and perception that's amazing where do you think this new business is going to take you then well, it's been very exciting that we've actually gone down a different avenue to every traditional estate agent. We're actually not just an estate agency, we're a lifestyle company. So if you go onto our website, we sell yachts, we sell planes, we sell helicopters, we sell all luxury lifestyle um, wares. We've already outgrown our little office in Camford Cliffs and we're now currently looking for a warehouse. And it, it's going to be shabby chic, it's going to have red carpets, chandeliers. We've co-branded with Sunseeker. They're going to put one of their smallest yachts, but it's going to be, it's going to have every possible extra. We have co-branded with a supercars sales outfit. They're going to have two supercars in there. We're going to have a jewellery counter. Um, and all of this will be able to be run by our employees, which is beautiful for those brands because they don't have to have staffing costs. But it's also great for our customers because a lot of our customers are celebrity type people who do not want to walk into a high street um, so it's fabulous that you can go into a car park and have the discretion but also they might buy more than one product from us hey why not buy a boat a car and a house um, these people can afford it well it's great to meet you uh, it's the first time I've met you I've heard about you uh, obviously on the grapevine for quite a bit and um, I, 
normally I say, I, you know, I wish my guests a lot of success, but I got a funny feeling you're going to get it anyway, whether I wish you that or not. <laughs> Max, it's been great meeting you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Lovely to meet you. I hope you enjoyed that. We upload new videos every week, so don't forget to subscribe.